This Week in Agribusiness, serving America's most essential industry, is brought to you by Case IH. Carbon programs continue to pique farmer interest across the country. Hello, folks. Thanks for tuning in to This Week in Agribusiness. I'm Mike Pearson in the studio today, and Max is with us as well. He's learning about carbon programs. We've seen these proliferate in recent years as companies try to meet consumer demand for sequestering carbon. Well, there's some new opportunities on the scene, and Max has the update. Mike, those carbon opportunities are something farmers are looking at closely right now. Surveying the landscape, trying to decide which way to go, how soon to make that move. Let's find out about the opportunity Cargill is offering with its Regen Connect as we visit here with Nathan Freeze from the company. Nathan, is there a lot of excitement out there yet or is it still kind of a wait and see attitude? How would you summarize it? I would say a lot of farmers are taking interest in the new emerging markets in the carbon space. I think that there's been a lot of talk, right? A lot of headlines over the last number of years here, but, but now we're really seeing uh, programs and, and opportunities come to life in a, in a real fashion uh, out at the farm gate. And, and so we're excited to be part of that as Cargo Regen Connect. Well, of course, your name is well known, your corporate name, and I would imagine that's one thing that sets you apart, but how else would you uh, set yourself apart from all of the others? And what is kind of a crowded landscape right now? I think it's uh, really important for farmers to find a program that's a good fit for them, right, for their for their production opportunities and what they're focused on. For Cargo Regen Connect, we focus on a fast uh, and simple enrollment where you're not spending uh, dozens of hours trying to put data into the program. We focus on a clear and transparent measurement model uh, that, that we use uh, with our partners uh, in Regrill, and then also really focusing on on that technical and financial support and where we can come around that farmer and really support that educational opportunity around adopting regenerative ag practices. What's the term of enrollment? Uh, and, and is there a stated rate up front? How is the rate determined? So we're paying a, a market leading $25 a metric ton of carbon sequestered. We, we believe uh, that's the clearest way to, to show the incentive to the farmer. The, the farmer puts in the information from his or her operation. And at that point, we do a carbon estimation immediately. And so the farmer gets to decide before they sign the contract, what their return will be uh, on those adopted practices. And again, the term of the contract is, is one year. Uh, and we hope to have farmers uh, sign multiple contracts uh, throughout the life of the program. So is there a, a portal, for example, that the producer could enter and then just put in the, the data into a, a template of some sort? Yeah, if you go to cardioregenconnect.com, there's, there's a button there that says enroll today or check your carbon sequestration potential. Once you uh, sign up for the program, uh, name, email, address, very simple, straightforward. You load in your primary information around where your land and, and your crops are located and what your cropping history and rotation looks like. At that point, uh, with a few more clicks, we'll be able to show you the carbon estimation outcome for, for, the, for the soil that you've enrolled into the, into the program. So many of our growers have a great track record already with practices out on their land. Are there a variety of practices that uh, come into play here? I mean, do we think of cover crops, for example, conservation tillage or no-till. Uh, what are, it would be the variety, Nathan? We, we focus, uh, so Carter Regen Connect focuses on, on soil health really through the reduction of tillage. So no-till or reduced till. Uh, and then implementing uh, new acres or expanded acres of cover crop. And so the farmer gets to choose whether that's a simple rye cover crop or, or a more complicated mix uh, that they want to put together that best suits their fields. But those are our two practices today. We know there's other outcomes that, uh, associated with carbon sequestration around water quality and nutrient management outcomes and things like that. Uh, I think markets are continuing to expand, uh, you know, understanding how to quantify that. But today, Cardio Regen Connect is focused on reduced tillage and cover crops. What's the enrollment period here? There is a timetable and there's a deadline for enrollment. Is there not coming up in a few weeks? Yeah, it's closing up quick. We've had a great response since we opened the program back in May. This is our second year of the program. Uh, and and we, close, we close program enrollment September 16th. And so about six weeks from now, we'll be, we'll be wrapping up this year two sign up and, and moving in uh, to, to the next phase of the program. Website again for us, if you would, please, Nathan. CargillRegenConnect.com. That's easy. CargillRegenConnect.com. Nathan Freeze, thank you. It's a pleasure to meet you. Nice to have you on with us here.
Thank you, Max. This portion of This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Firestone Ag. The Firestone Ag Dealer Network offers you the support, inventory, and resources you need. Visit FirestoneAg.com to find your local certified dealer. And now it's time to dig into these markets with Joe Camp, the Director of Managed Programs at Comstock Investments. Joe, this past week saw a lot of geopolitical turmoil. I want to start with the Russia-Ukraine situation. Market looks like we're expecting exports from those two countries of food crops. That news has been such a yo-yo, just like, uh, for example, wheat prices have been as a direct result. We go into the weekend a couple of weekends ago and have the news that there was an agreement reached between Russia and Ukraine with Turkey as a mediator to allow shipments out of the Black Sea ports. That was a negative for wheat prices, a general positive sign for those developments in the war in Ukraine. But it wasn't but hours later that there was a Russian attack on that key Odessa port. And there have since been attacks on other ports, even though we have learned that the first ship has left the Black Sea on its way to the Middle East. We're going to have to watch and see if this carries forward into bigger grain exports, potentially doubling or tripling what they have been doing. And that is the question, isn't it, Joe? It's not just whether or not they'll be allowed. It's how much physically can they export? I imagine the trade is still thinking Ukrainian exports are going to be down substantially this year. That's right. And so you get into the question of if the first ship is headed to Lebanon into the Middle East or eventually into North Africa, there's plenty of business for Ukraine there. But will there be the bigger buyers such as China stepping in? Uh, trusting the reliability again of Ukrainian exports for wheat and corn too in a big way. We know China has hedged their bets and allowing uh, approvals of Brazilian corn imports. So we'll see if that comes in a bigger way. Uh, but this is a potential shift back to the Black Sea trade uh, that could be a negative for U.S. exports. Although we've recently seen this per, uh, correction for prices that now ups the competitiveness for our own shippers too. Well, and Joe, you mentioned China right there. Of course, they've been in the headlines this past week with Speaker Pelosi's visit to that country. Is the trade breathing a sigh of relief now that she has left Taiwan? Breathing a sigh of relief, but then I think holding our breaths again to wonder what the retaliation or the next responses from China will be. We know about the military drills in the South China Sea around Taiwan, but going forward, will there be a retaliation against the U.S. that could involve a uh, further retentioning of uh, this trade spat we're in. It wasn't but uh, just a couple of days before uh, the China-Taiwan uh, drama that we saw uh, the White House come out with consideration of removal of different tariffs against Chinese goods. So in the future, we'll watch for that if anything changes there and monitor, of course, our uh, progress in connecting back with our biggest buyer of agricultural goods. Well, Joe, let's come back domestically. We've got the crop growing in the field here. August 12th, we're going to get an update from USDA on yields. On the corn front, do you expect to see much change in expected yield this growing season? Usually the August report produces big changes for the yield, but this year could be different because of the delayed start. There would be reason I would expect for the USDA to say, let's wait a little bit for uh, to see where we get a little bit further along in the season when we start to get crop samples, which happens in the next September report. But this report's important because it includes the farmer survey, the first one, and it should reflect that we've got uh, tough conditions out there in a lot of areas of the belt. And remember, we're currently dealing with a weather adjusted trend line yield at 177 bushels per acre, which is exactly even with last year's record. So we can compare last year and this year pretty simply and say that it would be pretty tough for now to think we could reach a, a new record uh, given the struggles that we have in a lot of areas. All right, we'll be back for more market conversation with Joe Camp, Director of Managed Programs at Comstock Investments. This portion of This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Firestone Ag. Harvey Firestone invented the first pneumatic farm tire, forever changing what it means to farm hard. Visit FirestoneAg.com to learn more about this history and tire solutions for today. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We're talking markets with Joe Camp, the Director of Managed Programs at Comstock Investments. And Joe, we've got a lot of questions, as you mentioned, about the supply side of the ledger on the corn front. But on the demand side, how has basis held up this summer? 
remarkably well, historically so. We're seeing such big premiums in different areas of the country. In part, it's a reflection of shortages of available grain. Of course, you talk about the Southwest where they've been in drought, pasture land drought, severe. We've got record high placements for so long. The feeders absolutely need the corn down there. We look at the North, still short supplies uh, and some demand still drawing forward from the ethanol processors in a big way into the rest of the season here. We're starting to see some of that slip. The ideas that the end users have pushed for coverage and are gonna wanna uh, test the waters here, uh, uh, whether or not they can hold over for new crop, depending on when that comes, right? There's gonna be some delays in a lot of areas because of the way it was planted. And so that could, again, support basis once we get back into the early part of harvest. Well, speaking of a crop coming to market, Joe, we've got the winter wheat crop coming off, uh, well, just about completely off the fields here across the Midwest. Looking out over the, uh, the short term, do you expect to see some additional weakness in wheat now that we've got this uh, extra supply? Yeah, you would think that maybe the harvest pressure is out of the way, but now it could be a negative that we have to realize that we've had some uh, good numbers at the tail end of this winter wheat harvest that can be reflected now in the August 12 crop report too. That's our next potential uh, big adjustment from the government analysts there on the wheat side. I think that for the most part though, we have seen such a sharp decline for wheat off of its highs that we have seen restored competitiveness for those U.S. exporters. And the numbers lately for wheat export sales have been good. A lot of that will go back to uh, what happens in Russia, Ukraine, and where does China make their purchases. Uh, but going forward, we feel like the price correction down has done enough that we could start to see some buying both from you know speculators and uh, but, and technical buyers, but also from the end users that we're talking about, the, uh, uh, the merchants and uh, the exporters in a bigger way now. Joe, let's turn our focus over to the oil seeds. The soybean complex, we've seen exceptional domestic demand from the crushing industry. Do you expect that to continue as we get closer to harvest? Yeah, we talk about the future of uh, soy processing and all of the renewable diesel and the plants popping up. That's going to take some time, but we're starting to ramp up production and, and storing uh, capacity in anticipation of that. And that's a bullish feature. But we are seeing that the soy complex is such at the whims of these outside crude oil markets and uh, the linked edible oil markets like palm oil. Uh, we see that palm oil has been down from its highs. We have the intervention from the Indonesian government but some rebuilding of inventories over there that have taken the edge off of soy oil a bit here lately. Going forward though, it's positive that we have such strong processing demand and that's been a benefit for basis on the soy side too. Well, August is of course the month we make those soybeans. Joe, do you anticipate any big changes to supply from the August 12th report from USDA on soybeans? Supply could change at least in terms of ending stocks very easily because we're at such a tight margin, it seems already at 230 million bushels projected for carry out, doesn't take much of an adjustment on yield or acres or demand uh, to move that number in a way that starts to be concerning if it, if it goes down, right? And we would be optimistic because of those things like we mentioned, soy processing demand going forward, export potential, but it's more of a supply side report like you mentioned, and so it's about yield. It seems like it's a little bit early for the August report to expect much. That makes sense. Folks, we've been talking with Joe Camp, Director of Managed Programs at Comstock Investments. Joe, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much. Chad Colby's look at agriculture technology comes your way next, brought to you by the IBM Watson Decision Platform. Combining AI with Internet of Things data to help agribusiness increase yields, improve quality, and drive sustainability. Of course, in the heat of summertime, it's never anybody's favorite thing to walk out into the garage to mow the lawn and see a flat tire. Well, Chad Colby agrees, and he's had enough of it. On this week's tech segment, he brings us an update to his lawnmower. Earlier this season on our tech segment, we talked about airless tire technology. You can see right here, here's two zero-turn mowers. The one on the right's got a pneumatic tire, conventional if you would, and the one on the left You'll see here in a second, that's the Michelin Tweel tire. Now they make that for ATVs, 
They also make it for a lot of other pieces of equipment. But on this week's tech segment, I'm going to take it one step further. I ordered a set of the Michelin Tweels for the front casters on my lawnmower. Obviously, you've got the benefits of not having to worry about flat tires, but those baffles, they provide some suspension. And you could see this example right here. I took the conventional foam-filled tires and I drove over a 2x4. You can see my oldest daughter, Bristol, right here can easily oscillate that tire because I'm pulling it off the ground just by driving over that 2x4. As far as the installation goes, super simple. It took less than 10 minutes to install both of these on the front of the mower. And I like that. It was very easy, very straightforward. Pull out the axle bolt, put the other one on, and you're in business. You could see me doing this right here. And here in a second, you're going to see some amazing footage by this. I had some friends ask me, why didn't you get these for the front of your mower, Chad? Well, quite frankly, I didn't even know they existed. They're relatively new. They make them for all kinds of mowers, depending on what you might have at home. But what I'm excited to share with you is you can just see it right there with your eye, the performance gains. And I've only used the mower once with these on. And let me tell you, it made a huge difference in the ride characteristics of the mower. I especially noticed it when I turned. I think that mower does a lot of weight transfer left to right, depending on which way you're turning. And it's so much smoother. You can see me right here as I go through the yard. It's just a really nice ride. Now, this mower does have a suspension seat, um, which also helps quite a bit. But I was super impressed. These aren't terribly expensive. It's about a $400 option. And like I said earlier, it's super easy to put on. But I'll tell you what, if you're like me and you spend a fair amount of time on a lawnmower, it's just nice to know you've got the convenience of airless. That means you don't have to worry about downtime or opening up that shed and seeing your mower sitting there with a flat tire. We all know how annoying that is. Again, just another great example of adding new technology that can really make a difference. For This Week in Agribusiness, I'm Chad Colby. Thank you, Chad. And not just performance gains, I've got to say from my perspective, those new wheels look pretty cool. But it also looked like that lawn could use a drink, and that's the case in a lot of places across the Corn Belt. Later on in this week's program, we're going to hear from meteorologist Greg Solier about what to expect in the forecast for the week ahead. Welcome back to This Week in Agribusiness. Pivot Bio is putting in the spotlight some of the new ideas, the innovations, the inventions that agriculture will need in the future. We want to share some of those with you here on our broadcast. Pivot Bio is calling the series Farm Next, and they're looking at things such as Clear Flame Technologies, a company that can take diesel engines, such as those in farm tractors, trucks, and combines, and make them burn ethanol fuel. Let's take a look. Farmers are critical to the 17 billion gallons of ethanol that we produce in this country every year. Right now, they have no way to use that fuel in the trucks that move their goods around or in the tractors and combines that plant and harvest their crop. With ClearFlame, they can do all of those things with a fuel that they are a critical part of the production chain. ClearFlame's technology is a set of modifications that can be made to existing diesel engine designs to let them run on 100% plant-based ethanol fuel straight from the ethanol plant. The heart of the process is a high temperature combustion system. Basically, we tweak out things like fuel injectors, air handling, and exhaust to make the entire engine operate at an elevated temperature and you're no longer constrained to use easy to ignite fuels like diesel, but you can use something that is traditionally hard to ignite but also cheap and cleaner like ethanol. Over the next five to 10 years, I hope to see the agriculture community take a leading role in the energy transition. They're well positioned for it and also equipped for that leadership role. The biggest problem that ClearFlame still has is that people don't know this type of solution is possible, that you can run a diesel engine on ethanol fuel and that it is a technology that is ready to go today. So being on Farm Next is gonna allow more of the world to hear a solution our story and get excited about what we're ready to bring to market. Clear Flame Technologies, and we go to Plains Technologies. They make an autonomous robot that can put in cover crops behind the combine. Farmers have a very difficult job. They're in charge of 100 different things on any given day. So we want to simplify some of the things they do. 
talking to some collaborating producers, we found that producers really run out of time during the harvest season. Some of them quoted like, hey, you know, if you have a robotic system that can follow our combine and do cover crop seeding, that will be a really nice system. Then we don't have to think about how to find additional labor during busy seasons. We are hoping to improve nitrogen inputs into the soil, and we plan to attack that problem with our autonomous robot here. So that might include following a combine through after it's gone and harvested, let's say, say a corn crop, something that uh, leaches nitrogen from the soil. We can dump certain legume cover crops into the ground, which will improve the soil health for the next year. Right now, cover crop seeding is done by broadcasting the seed. And with that, the problem is you don't have an effective seed to soil contact. So that's why if you have a robotic system that can actually precisely drill the cover crop, you will have a really good success. I'm very confident about the agriculture industry adapting because we are now talking about artificial intelligence and AI and robotics in agriculture. Farmers are going to take it only if it has a return on investment. So we want to collaboratively work with farmers. We've networked with 20 or 30 farmers. We've listened to their voices, seen what they like, seen what they don't like, and we're trying to adapt to better fit their needs. And we're just looking to grow from there. That's the story of Plains Technologies. And what if you could put a cover crop in the field that performs those duties of a cover crop, and yet you can then market it just the way you do your other crops? It's called Covercress. My name is Dale Sorensen, and I'm the Chief Commercial Officer of Covercress Incorporated. I'm a South Dakota farm boy originally, and have been in agriculture my entire career. This will be my 41st crop season working in agriculture with farmers. The inspiration for Covercrest really started back in 2013 with a couple of gentlemen that were pulling field pennycrest samples from across the countryside that really created the first base genetics that could be utilized in breeding and developing a new crop called Covercrest. Covercrest gives you an opportunity to raise a third crop in with corn and soybeans over a two year period. This crop actually grows through the entire winter season from fall till spring. And during that winter season, it is developing a root system. It's keeping something alive in that soil during the entire winter months, rather than a brown landscape that you typically see in farm country. With earthworms being able to move in, it's starting to create a home for a host of good things to happen in the soil. Being able to protect that soil surface during those heavier rain periods that can occur in March and April is another big benefit. As you get to the latter part of the season, this crop has the potential to capture close to a ton of carbon per acre during its growth cycle when most acres in the central United States don't have anything going on. The reception has just been unbelievably positive. We've got a limited launch this fall with several thousand acres, and we've actually got more farmers interested than we're gonna have seed available as we get to this fall. Covercrest, Plains Technologies, Clear Flame Technologies, just three of the inventions, the innovations that you'll find at Farm Next. You can go online and see them all. PivotBio.com. While you're there, you can vote for the one that you think is most likely to succeed. And you can enter to win a VIP pass to the 2022 Farm Progress Show, where all of these inventions will be on display and you can meet the inventors. There's more coming up on This Week in Agribusiness. This Week in Agribusiness, serving America's most essential industry, is brought to you by Case IH. Welcome back to This Week in Agribusiness, folks. Back in February, when Russia invaded Ukraine globally, the attention turned towards the wheat market, since those two countries are such key global exporters of that crop. And a lot of the attention turned towards the spring wheat crop in particular, which in the U.S. saw a short crop in 21 due to drought, and in the spring of this year saw delays due to excessive rainfall. That meant there was a lot of interest in how the crop is performing. Al Gustin filed this report from the recently completed spring wheat tour. The Hard Red Spring Wheat Tour is always held the last week in July, which is a couple of weeks after the USDA July crop production report. So these crop scouts have the numbers from that USDA report in their back pocket. One thing is certain, 
This year's spring wheat crop will be much larger than last year's drought ravaged 30 bushel per acre, little more than half a crop. How much larger is what these scouts will be calculating. And then we punch all those numbers in, <clears throat> the number of heads per, per yard, uh, times, the, times the size of the heads, times the kernels per spikelet, divided by the row width. Carloads of crop scouts will stop in hundreds of spring wheat fields during the three-day tour. And at the end of each day, the scouts get together and compare notes. So we have 13 drivers. Uh, we follow the same eight routes that we follow every year. and gives us some consistency. And we've got producers here. We've got grain companies here. We have flour millers here. All the wheat organizations, NOG and mm -hmm. <coughs> U.S. Wheat Associates, uh, flour millers, end users, bakers, and breading manufacturers. And eight stops. Uh, Average calculated yield of 46.7, average our, uh, average eyeball yield 45. The highest yield we saw was 64, uh, lowest yield 21.6. At the end of the three days, the final yield estimate came in at 49 bushels per acre. That's two bushels more than USDA's July 12th estimate. These strong yields come even though about 40% of the crop was planted in June. Planting would typically wrap up in mid-May. So it has the potential to be a good spring wheat crop, which is what the end users are hoping for. Not only did we have a drought last year that cut our production over 40%, um, the Canadians also had a drought, so their spring wheat crop also cut about 40%. So when you look at the supplies available to the world of high protein spring wheat, they've gotten quite tight. Yield prospects are good, but U.S. spring wheat acreage in 2022 is the smallest of the last five years. Harvest is still at least three weeks away for most of the wheat. For This Week in Agribusiness, I'm Al Gustin. Thanks to Al Gustin for sending that report, and I think it's no surprise that when those combines do start to run here in a matter of weeks, the trade will be watching closely to see what yields are reported out of North Dakota and the Canadian prairies. Greg Solier now brings us his farm weather forecast for the week ahead, presented by Pivot Bio Proven 40. Predictable, productive, weatherproof. Turn to a better nitrogen. Turn to Pivot Bio Proven 40. Learn more at pivotbio.com. As the month of August heats up, traders are watching the weather to see what that could mean for commodity prices. So are we. Greg Solier joins us this week. And Greg, what are you watching across the Pacific Northwest this yeah. next week? If you want to get in the nuts and bolts of the meteorology, you know, you take a look at that 500 millibar chart. It really takes in about three quarters of the whole atmospheric volume up to around this time of the year, 28, 29, 30,000 feet. And when you see those numbers of 588, 594, you have found the hot ridge, which Early in the week is lined up its eastern flank here across the central divide into the Plain States areas and these ridge riding thunderstorm clusters coming across parts of the Dakotas. Yeah, Nebraska leading the pack with the worst of the corn crop. But look at here, look at the trough into northern California, coastal sections of Washington and Oregon. There may be some significant rainfall, these coastal areas early in the week. Pretty benign frontal boundary across the Intermountain West and the usual summertime thunderstorm activity, all or nothing, lightning and fires, or where it's burned down. And you get a downpour, you get flash flooding. So a couple of showers, Pacific Northwest cooler air as the uh, mid to late week uh, progresses. Here is the triple digit stuff lined up uh, basically east of Yellowstone out through the Nebraska Panhandle points on southward 100, 105, not fit for men or beast. And again, on the northern and eastern flank of that hot ridge, a couple of thunderstorm clusters, Canadian Prairie into areas of North Dakota. Canadian Prairie's had some respectable rains of late as well. In the southwestern states, it's the old monsoon setup early into the uh, weekend. The hot weather triple digit stuff central divide working its way into the plains along this boundary here. A couple of thunderstorms expected blowtorch with any crop on the grounds, Oklahoma, western Oklahoma and Texas and a couple of showers and thunderstorms have made it into the sea area. You saw the flooding around the casinos in Vegas over the past week, even a rain shower from Napa on northward. The tropics in the Pacific are a little bit active. This system don't think it's coming ashore, obviously, but it may uh, generate a couple of showers even into Southern California. 105 degree actual air temperatures, Nebraska and Kansas and undercutting the ridge, a little tropical moisture, maybe a downpour or two with showers and thunderstorms in the old monsoon setup in the Southwest. 
Watching out for crop development across the Corn Belt, Greg. Is the weather going to do us any favors this next week? For some, yes. For others, it's been almost a, too much of a good thing. And in some areas, we have literally gone from a uh, drought to a flood. For example, southern Missouri, southern Illinois, that I-70 and I-64 corridor down there, uh, 15, 20 inches of rain, and then some over the past couple of weeks. So there's cooler air here. Here's the jet stream complex frontal boundaries, and you get these thunderstorm clusters that kind of meander their way out of the Dakotas, northern and eastern Corn Belt locales. That's the early to middle parts of the week. We see that boundary kind of lifting back to the north, and some of this triple digit stuff may catch the western parts of Iowa again. Downstate Illinois with the high humidity values as well will cap off the atmosphere here, but keep the thunderstorms are going out of the eastern Dakotas, northern and eastern Corn Belt as well. Again, to get these storms to recur, refire, repeat over the same areas, that's how you come up with flash flooding. The atmosphere capped off largely central and southern plains, a little humidity with some monsoon moisture in the southwest western states as well as into the lower Mississippi Valley where the heat wave weather conditions continue on. Note the absence of any tropical systems in the Gulf for now. That may be changing in the next couple of weeks. Hot weather continues and dry time too from Kansas, Oklahoma on southward. Eastern Corn Belt sitting well with moisture so far. Greg, does that continue? Yeah, especially in the central parts of Illinois, Indiana, as well as Michigan, which were some of the lingering dryness and drought related areas. We should see some improvement there. Those rains are million dollar in nature. Here's this complex frontal boundary. Jet stream winds are riding along it, and so are the thunderstorm clusters recurring and repeating out of the upper Midwest, northern and eastern Corn Belt locales, and here is the warm front to its west. The atmosphere capped off, probably 100 degree heat, actual air temperatures out through the mid Missouri Valley and the western and southern Corn Belt locales. Cooler, dry air up through the northeast of New England. Wet weather too is much needed in the areas of the mid-Atlantic region. Hot and humid weather, one piece of the hot ridge here into the southeastern states, 100 degree heat, and then some all the way into the Gulf Coast areas. That's the early part of the week. The heat retrogrades to the west. Thunderstorm clusters along the Gulf Coast, meaningful rain in the cool off for the Carolinas. And again, for now, quiet across the Atlantic Basin, but that may be changing here in the next week to 10 days. Greg Sodier is back with his extended farm weather forecast for the country, presented by Pivot Bio Proven 40. Predictable, productive, weatherproof. Turn to a better nitrogen. Turn to Pivot Bio Proven 40. Learn more at pivotbio.com. And we're back discussing the weather with Greg Solier. And Greg, you mentioned the heat next week is going to be profound, but there's also the chance of moisture. Who's going to see the rainfall? Uh, some areas that actually need it, but you know this time of the year, you get the rain, it comes at a price. Hail, high wind, lodging blowdown, greed snap, and all that kind of stuff. If you get these thunderstorms as they grow vertically, they tap into the uh, jet stream levels, and you're off to the races with that high wind and hail prospect, of which we anticipate some of that nonsense again in this particular corridor. But again, additional meaningful drought easing, maybe drought ending rains again for parts of Illinois, Indiana into the Great Lakes region. Don't need any more of it where there's ongoing flooding and cleanup and recovery. Southern Illinois, the crops are underwater in some of those areas south of I-70 and of course down through Kentucky. Some tropical downpours in this part of the country. Not much of anything Oklahoma, Texas. Monsoon moisture, all or nothing. Southwestern states and there may be at least some spotty half inch moisture into the Pacific Northwest and a little system offshore in the Pacific as well. The Atlantic Basin might getting active here, but still about a week to 10 days out. All right, well, let's look at that next week. August 15th, Greg, is that hot ridge still in place? It is still into play. It's just going to warble back and forth, back and forth uh, to maybe the western corn belt at some weeks, back to the divine other weeks. Here it is, locked into the heartland. Uh, plenty of warmth here, plenty of heat, even for the mid to late portions of the month of August. A little bit of a drop in temperatures southeast, a little troughiness into northern California and the Pacific Northwest, where there may be some more and additional moisture into this part of the country. The mind soon set up is prolific again all or nothing downpours flooding or some lightning strikes and more fires into that part of the country we're back to dry time here across the heartland wet weather continues on over the southeastern parts of the country as mentioned we'll keep an eye on the western and southwestern atlantic basin mid to late august well, as we get into mid to late August, the August 22nd and beyond, Greg, does that heat ridge ever start to dissipate? Not really. I think it's something that sticks around. It's part of La Nina, by the way, and the indications are La Nina sticks around well into the fall and probably early winter. And so if you want to take a look at the fall and winter maps and charts, you really don't want to take a look at them at this vantage point. They are pretty uh, troublesome with the moisture and storm. It's anyway, Gulf Coast is below average. The heat kind of retrogrades slightly back into this part of the country, bit of a drop in temperature 
temperatures in the northeast of New England as jet stream winds come in from the northwest. But we get these ridge riding thunderstorm clusters along the top of the ridge, along kind of a warm front that'll shape up here. So we're back to weather busyness for the northern plains, eastern Corn Belt, and here is some tropical moisture in the southeastern part of the country and through Texas. Good news here in the southwestern states too. The monsoon setup continues on, but get this pattern here west to east in the tropics. Going to be busy here in the waning days of August. Greg, that last week of August, it's Farm Progress Show. What can folks expect? Uh, probably long lines at the uh, beverage stand and uh, kind of, uh, you know, we're on the cusp of uh, some seasonal heat. I don't think anything out of control. Humidity up and elevated over Boone, Iowa, and somewhat above average temperature readings here. Still capable of upper 80s and low 90s, the uh, warmth, if you will, into the eastern part of the country, a trough in the western and northwestern sections of the country. So, it will be chasing thunderstorms probably at farm progress, but the late planted varieties, the pasture lands will appreciate the rainfall may come at a price with severe stuff across the northern and central plains. Some drought relief here over a wide area of the Corn Belt, and we'll keep an eye on the tropics across the eastern Gulf, the southwest Atlantic up the eastern seaboard, moisture too for the Pacific Northwest. Next on This Week in Agribusiness, it's Max's Tractor Shed, spotlighting another great American tractor. It's a Ford tractor and a Max's tractor shed this weekend, and I must say, even though I haven't seen this color combination too many times, I like it a lot. Max's Tractor Shed is brought to you by Store Lock Tool Cabinets. I want to let you know that the Store Lock folks will be at the Farm Progress Show this year, August 30th and 31st and September 1st in Boone, Iowa. I believe they're going to be located along the east side of 4th Street there, a little bit south of Central Avenue at the Farm Progress Show site. Make it a point to go see them. They'll have cabinets there. You can get your questions answered and make arrangements to have yours delivered. Check out the website storelock.com. Well, John Bruns in central Illinois has restored a lot of tractors over the years. He keeps the list. He knows the dozens and dozens and dozens of tractors that he's restored. He's written it all down on his pad of paper. I think this one, though, he's especially proud of. Restored in memory of Danny Owens for the Danny Owens family there at Danville, Illinois. And look at the color of that paint. I think I've seen the 1871 Industrial in the red and gray. I think I've seen it in highway yellow at some time or another. But this color combination is beautiful. Nice job there by John Bruns, who's restored a lot of tractors in central Illinois, including this one, an 1871 made in 1958. Well, Mark Stock has some more recent models moving across the block at Big Iron Auctions. Let's see what's selling in the week ahead as we switch to Mark for his report. Hey, Max, this is Austin Anderson, multimedia producer for Big Iron Auctions, covering for Mark Stock this week. Currently for our August 10th sale, we have 1,499 items for sale. One auction people should definitely check out is the Larry Mudloff Retirement out of Page, Nebraska. Larry has 56 items up for auction. He has a John Deere 1770 NT 12R 30-inch planner, a 2014 Landall 7431 Dash 20 VT vertical tillage disc, a 2008 John Deere 8130 MFWD tractor, and a 2006 John Deere 9660 STS combine. Then there's the Oak Creek Farm Retirement going on in Elgin, Nebraska. The sale has a Brint 1082 grain cart, 2006 Peterbilt 378 TA day cab truck tractor, a 1997 John Deere 8400 MFWD tractor. You can check out all these items and more at BigIron.com. And if you've been thinking about selling, now is the time. The market is hot, so reach out to a representative in your area and get your stuff listed today. Well, folks, we love to highlight the next generation of leaders to come out of rural America. And this week, we're meeting another one. Alexis Hughes just completed her term as the South Dakota State FFA reporter. And Alexis, what were some of the highlights from your year of service? Yeah, so we have leadership camp, which was one of my favorites. So we have an East River and a West River camp. And I got to get super close with the members in my group and teach them a lot about advocacy and how to just be better members. And it was one of my favorites. And then going to national convention over my birthday was super fun where I got to be a delegate 
and vote on stuff for the future of FFA. That's fantastic. You mentioned teaching leadership. Alexis, was that something that you got out of FFA in your time as a member? Absolutely. So I learned a lot about how to connect with people and learn a lot more about how you can advocate for agriculture and be that person that the world needs right now. And you can get some cool experiences in FFA as well. Alexis, what are, what's one of your favorite memories? Yeah, so I went to National Convention actually with my horse judging team back in 2019 and we were all best friends so it was super fun to go with them and be with my best friends at National Convention and we actually ended up placing fourth in the nation so that was one of my best memories. Alexis, South Dakota is a very big state. When you were serving a state reporter, did you have a chance to cover a lot of it? Oh yeah, I didn't know a lot about East River towns and I definitely went to a lot of them and it was super fun getting to learn more about the state that I've lived in my whole life. And as you look out to the future, do you plan to stay in agriculture or in South Dakota? I plan to stay in South Dakota and have a, I didn't grow up in an agriculture family, so I still plan, I wanna have horses when I'm older and everything, but I'm actually gonna be going into nursing in the future. Fantastic. Well, we, well, want, we want to, to wish you the best of luck, Alexis, as you go on to the future. Thanks for your service to the FFA. Welcome back to This Week in Agribusiness. Ladies and gentlemen, you've heard for the past several weeks on this program, Max and I get very excited about the Farm Progress Show coming at the end of August, first day in September, here in just about a month. But we're not the only people excited. Rick Wild, the Farm Progress Show Manager, has been living on site in Boone, getting things ready to go. He joins us today. Rick, I bet it's so peaceful out there this time of year, you can hear that corn growing in the background on the show site. You can hear the corn growing. I mean, outside of the corn growing, you know, starting on the 25th when I got here that week, you know, we actually started getting tents in the ground. So um, last week we started getting tents in the ground. We got starting landscapers are moving on site. So outside of being um, quiet, it's not so much quiet no more. You hear a lot of pounding going on. <laughs> That's right. That activity is getting underway. We talk about the Farm Progress Show a lot. I have been blessed to attend many of them. So has Max. So have you, Rick. But I'm curious if somebody's never been to a Farm Progress Show, if this year in Boone is their first one, what's their experience going to be like arriving at the show grounds? So the first, I mean, their experience is going to be uh, the wow factor. It's like, hey, first dealing through the traffic, getting to the show. Um, once again on the show, it's just it, it's going to be so overwhelming because if you've never been to one, you never realize how much acreage there is to look for inside the fence and outside the fence where the field demos are going on. Well, when we talk about acreage, Rick, I mean, how much are we talking? How many exhibitors? What size are we dealing with here at the Farm Progress Show? So inside inside the fence area, it's about 100 acres and roughly about 660 exhibitors will be at the show. That is incredible. And when we think about farm progress, of course, uh, at least I think of the big equipment out there running in the corn, doing the demonstrations, sitting on the lots, but there's also the varied industries tents, Rick, with, with all sorts of different exhibitors. There is, there is. So the varied industry tent is going to be a new experience for everybody this year. Iowa Soybean and Farm Progress had put together a project where the entire inside of the uh, VIP tent has been asphalted with a soy product asphalt. Mm -hmm. It roughly in size is around 664 feet wide by about 670 feet long. That is incredible. I believe it is just shy of an acre, isn't it, Rick, of, of new hard surface? It's pretty close to an acre, but just shy, yes. That is something else. And of course, when you're walking around all day, you're touring all this stuff, you're talking to all the experts at Farm Progress, Rick, a fella can get kind of hungry. What are the food situations for visitors at Farm Progress? So, so obviously we have all the food for or the four food tents that are on the four quadrants of the show. Um, in between that, you'll have individual sales of food that'll be on corners. Um, will you will have plenty of food for everyone? <laughs> Certainly, and I will say, folks, if you're hungry, stop by those those exhibitors, the tents, or the individual booths. You never know what you might find. There are some tasty treats there for sure. And Rick, the other question I've heard from a few folks is just getting around on the grounds. 100 acres is a lot of territory. What's the situation on golf carts? So right now, right now, golf carts are sold out for the show. 
Um, everyone that is coming is has been sold and it is done, but there will be a lot of golf carts on the grounds. Um, but they at this point they are sold out. Can people bring their own golf carts to Farm Progress? They can. Absolutely they can. They'll have to go through the registration process, but we do allow golf carts on site. And that registration process is key and folks can get tickets online, I believe as well. Rick, where can folks go to get those vehicles registered or to get their tickets and lock down their appearance at Farm Progress? So obviously they can get their tickets at the gate, but they can also do that online for the Farm Progress show. As far as golf carts go, there'll be a there'll be a people owned line and there'll be a rental line and basically come through the people line and they'll be able to do all the registration right on site. Folks, get after it, get those tickets secured. Go to farmprogressshow.com. Thanks to Rick Wild, the show director at Farm Progress. Thank you. Well, folks, those dates, August 30th, the 31st, and September 1st, if you've never been, I hope you make the 2022 Farm Progress Show your inaugural event. We look forward to seeing you there. And folks, thank you so much for tuning in to This Week in Agribusiness today. We've got a lot more coming next week as we talk about the issues that are impacting agriculture throughout our industry. Thanks for watching, folks. We look forward to seeing you right here again next week. Closed captioning for This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Kubota. Shape your world. This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Case IH. This Week in Agribusiness is produced by Omax Communication in association with 22 Creative Group. We invite you to visit us online at agbizweek.com.